TRIP stands for Transformation Induced Plasticity, in which the shape deformation due to martensitic transformation is exploited in order to improve the mechanical properties of steels. And one of the problems with steels is that as you make them stronger, in general, the ductility will decrease. Uh, it's not always the case. And today we will look at a particular example, which is an exception. Now, when it comes to making components, uh, okay. TRIP stands for Transformation Induced Plasticity, in which we exploit the shape deformation due to martensitic transformation in order to get enhanced properties, and in particular, to buck the trend that as the strength is increased, the ductility decreases. Now, if you look at this complex component, this is an inner panel, of a car door, uh, it is obviously advantageous to form this into this complicated shape rather than join up different bits of uh, metal to get that structure. Uh, and we also want to make the steel as strong as possible so that the weight of the door is reduced. So it needs to be strong and it needs to be formable and some of the forming needs to be done with, in the presence of holes in the blank that you shape into this um, object. Uh, there's also a bar here, which is a, for reinforcing the car against side impact. And it emphasizes the importance of trying to reduce weight because safety regulations mean that in the last 15 years or so, the weight of the average weight of an automobile has not actually gone down, it's gone up uh, because of all the safety regulations. So there's an ever present drive to increase the strength, but also at the same time, a basket of other properties such as formability. Now, in some cases, uh, this whole panel uh, need not be made from a single steel, because you may not require a thicker part at the top, whereas the lower part of the door might require to be a higher thickness. To cope with this, uh, we use what's known as tailored blanks. So here in the background, you have two pieces of uh, steel with different mechanical properties, uh, joined together by laser welding, and then this tailored blank, you know, a bit like a patchwork, uh, tailored blank can be formed into this complex shape, which goes into the inner panels of um, both the doors and the side panel. So in order to optimize the use of materials, what you see as a very uniform uh, body, may actually consist of a whole different range of steels. So that is a very clever way of reducing weight and laser welding is now quite routine. So a production facility would buy the laser welded tailor blanks and then form them into whatever they want to do. Now, about uh, 20 or 30 years ago, uh, many cars were made using a steel which has a strength of the order of 500 megapascals. Uh, and this is a kind of a uniform elongation, although there's a yield point which doesn't all go well for formability. You can now get trip steels, that means transformation induced plasticity steels, which are much stronger and show a much greater extent of uniform elongation, uh, certainly sufficient uniform elongation to form the sort of parts that I illustrated earlier. So the question is, why does this steel uh, have 
significant ductility in spite of the fact that it's almost um, two or three times the strength of what used to be the case 30 years ago. Okay, uh, let's think a little bit more about the shape deformation associated with martensite. This is a spectacular atomic force microscope image of the shear deformations produced by martensite plates. You can see the scratch has been deflected and of course you have the surface topography which is obvious. Um, and this is in an alloy which is fully austenitic until you get to a temperature below about minus 80 degrees centigrade. So we've got about 31 weight percent nickel and 0 0.32 carbon. Now I've explained to you in the first lecture that the shape deformation is like so. Uh, this is the invariant plane or the habit plane of martensite. And when this cube of austenite transforms into martensite, we have a shear strain and a dilatation normal to this habit plane. So this is a general invariant plane strain. And I've used a unit cube here. And these axes here are orthonormal. In other words, Z1, Z2, which points outside of the plane of the diagram, and Z3 are unit vectors uh, at 90 degrees to each other. So what I want is I want to be able to find out what happens to an arbitrary vector as a consequence of this deformation. So I need to define a deformation matrix, which is referred to this orthonormal coordinate system. So this is how we explain that this is an invariant plane strain referred to an orthonormal coordinate system Z defined by Z1, Z2, and Z3. So to work out this deformation matrix is very simple. This is Z1, and we discover what happens to Z1 as a consequence of this deformation. Well, nothing happens. So we just write 1, 0, 0, because the Z1 lies in the invariant plane. Similarly, Z2, which points out of the plane of the board, lies in the invariant plane, and therefore it doesn't change either in direction or in magnitude. So the second column here is simply 0, 1, 0. But if I look at Z3, this vector here, it changes into this vector here, which, is, uh, which has components uh, along Z1, which is S, doesn't have any component along Z2, and along Z3, uh, it has a component uh, one plus zeta here, okay? So this is what happens to zero, zero, one as a consequence of that invariant plane strain. Now, if I multiply this matrix by any vector, then I can get a resultant vector, which is a consequence of the operation of this invariant plane strain. So here we are, this is the equation representing what happens to a vector u by that invariant plane strain to give us a new vector v still defined in the same coordinate system. So the vector v will in general be changed in magnitude and direction by this deformation. Of course, if it lies in an invariant plane, it won't be changed, but in general, it will be altered in magnitude and direction by this deformation. So let's take uh, uh, a vector 101, initial vector 101. If I multiply this matrix here by 101, so this is a, a column matrix, and we multiply row by column, so the first, first index that we get for the resultant vector is one plus S, which is here. Uh, the second row multiplied by this column gives us a zero. And the third row multiplied by this column, uh, third row, sorry, multiplied by this column gives us one plus Psi. And when I substitute the values of the shear strain, and the dilatational strain, I get the resultant vector is 1.260, 1.03. Now using this, 
uh, I can work out the lengthening of the vector by the invariant plane strain. And that's simply one minus the magnitude of V divided by the magnitude of U. So that is the effective strain, the elongation along the 101 direction. Now, when we apply uh, stress in order to change the shape of a component, that stress will act to trigger martensite if the circumstances are appropriate. So I want to now define the circumstances that would lead to stress-induced martensitic transformation. So it's not transformation which is caused by cooling the steel. We are actually operating above its normal martensite start temperature but it is induced by a stress. And you know, I emphasized early on that you should think about a martensitic transformation as a combination of a deformation and a change in crystal structure. So if it is a deformation, then of course you can induce it by stress if the circumstances are appropriate. So let's investigate what those circumstances might be. Well, just to remind you of the definition of the martensite start temperature, that means the temperature at which martensite first appears on cooling. Oops, sorry. Uh, if this is the free energy curve of ferrite as a function of temperature, and this is the free energy curve of austenite as a function of temperature, then the difference in free energy between the product and the parent is given by this arrow and we define that as the critical value of the free energy change required to induce martensite. So this would not be enough, so I need to cool further, further, further until I get to this particular value of the driving force, and that gives me martensite. And this, of course, is the T0 temperature where both phases have the same free energy and composition. Now, you might recall from the first or second lecture that this term here will include the stored energy due to the shape deformation and uh, due to any twin interfaces in the martensite, etc. And that comes to around 700 joules per, mole, joules per mole. And in some cases, you might require additional undercooling in order to get a detectable nucleation rate. So in general, this quantity here tends to be approximately minus a thousand joules per mole. Okay. So if we have these free energy curves, we can calculate the martensite start temperature. And I've repeatedly said that it's now possible to do such calculations of the thermodynamics routinely because there are massive databases and algorithms to interpret those databases and do calculations for most, most um, situations. Okay, so this is the driving force at which martensite would be triggered by cooling the supercooling the austenite to this temperature, and that defines the martensite start temperature. Now, if we apply a tensile stress, say, then that will stimulate the martensite to form if the mechanical component of the driving force is large enough. So let me explain that. So this is the curve representing the chemical free energy change when the stress is zero as a function of the temperature here. So it's delta G gamma alpha as a function of temperature when there's no applied stress. Now, if the applied stress is such that it assists the deformation associated with martensite, okay, just like you know, applying a tensile stress will, uh, will um, result in a resolved shear stress on a slip plane, and therefore it will trigger certain slip planes to operate. So if I apply this stress, and that is favorable to the formation of martensite, then I will add a quantity U to the chemical driving force. So now this becomes our net free energy change associated with martensite under the influence of a finite stress. So originally, without a stress, 
the MS temperature is defined by the point where this driving force reaches the critical value of roughly minus a thousand joules per mole. But if the stress assists the formation of martensite, that means the strain caused by martensite complies with the applied stress, then this value is reached at a higher temperature, Ms sigma. So even if we have austenite, which is above the martensite start temperature, the application of a stress which assists the formation of martensite will raise the martensite start temperature and you will trigger martensite purely by the application of stress. Okay. So I'll come back to the meaning of this mechanical interaction energy between martensite and the stress uh, later. But obviously, if I'm applying a stress, only those crystallographic variants of martensite which best comply with the applied stress will be triggered preferentially, okay? So those might lie, say, at, if it's a tensile stress, they might lie approximately at 45 degrees to the tensile axis because uh, that happens to be the plane on which you get the maximum shear stress. Okay, but there is a, a consequence to that. If you are only triggering certain crystallographic variants of martensite, then your microstructure will be non-random. Uh, non so in general, you know, an austenite grain can contain 24 different orientations of martensite plates, but when you apply a stress, only those crystallographic variants which comply with the stress will form. And of course, if I change the magnitude of the stress to a higher value, then this red curve will shift to higher temperatures and we will alter the martensite start temperature. So here is a, an experiment in which you take uh, a fully austenitic sample here, but it's a tapered tensile specimen. So when you pull it in these, in these directions, uh, there is a gradient of stress. And you can see that the amount of martensite that forms scales with the stress. Okay, so we expect U to vary linearly with an applied tensile stress. And this uh, particular alloy, again, a very high nickel concentration, has a martensite start temperature of minus 44 degrees centigrade. And this is actually pulled at room temperature. So you can see that it is purely stress-induced transformation. And if you look at the microstructure, remember that this is a polycrystalline austenitic alloy and the stress axis is horizontal. Uh, tensile stress axis, then you can see that this is a non-random structure that develops with the plates approximately at 45 degrees to the tensile axis. Okay, now this is in spite of the fact that this is a polycrystalline sample and the reason is uh, that within each grain there are 24 orientations possible. So it's possible to find some orientations which will, be, which, will be, which will have their habit planes close to the plane of maximum shear stress. And you know, when I talk about maximum shear stress, we must bear in mind there's also a volume change. So we need to treat this problem quantitatively. But this picture shows you very clearly that the structure that you obtained will no longer be a random array of plates of martensite, random as far as the 24 different orientations allow. Uh, but there will be some alignment of plates because they happen to be the ones that are most compliant to the applied stress. Now, supposing I want to resolve the applied stress onto the habit plane of martensite, uh, how do I do that? Well, you worked on more circles, and here is a more circle for a uniaxial tensile stress being applied along this direction. This is shear stress, and this is uh, the normal, uh, normal stress. And let's assume that the habit plane normal is at an angle theta to the tensile axis. So if you want to work out the normal stress on the habit plane and the shear stress on the habit plane, then we do this construction where this height here gives us the shear stress on the habit plane. And 
sigma n here is the normal stress on the heavy plane. Now, bearing in mind that stress times strain uh, gives us the interaction energy, we need to know these quantities as a function of orientation. So that if you look at the geometry of this, uh, this triangle here, then tau naught, which is the shear stress on the heavy plane, will be half the tensile stress times sine of two theta. The sine of two theta is that divided by that, okay? And that distance there is half sigma one. Uh, similarly, sigma one is our applied stress. The normal stress you can work out as this plus this. So we have one plus cos two theta because this distance here is cos two theta times sigma one. Okay, so we can calculate the shear stress and the normal stress on any orientation of the heavy plane. Now, we need to think about energy because when the interaction energy is large, it will favor those plates to form. So how do you work out energy? Well, you simply multiply stress by plastic strain because these are plastic strains. So there's no factor of half as we would have in a Hooke's law uh, scenario where it's half sigma times epsilon. Here, we simply multiply the stress by strain and that gives us the mechanical interaction energy U. So this is the shear stress here multiplied by the shear strain of the uh, Martin site. So U here is the mechanical interaction energy between the applied stre tensile stress and the Martin site as a function of this orientation uh, of the habit plane. Uh, so that's the shear stress multiplied by the shear strain, and that's the normal stress multiplied by the normal strain. So that gives us the mechanical interaction energy. What I want to do is find the orientation of the Martin site plate which maximizes u. So I differentiate u with respect to theta, obtain this and you find that the optimum orientation uh, given by theta max is S over theta. Okay, so that gives you the orientation of the plate which will experience the maximum mechanical interaction energy. Uh, and you know, if you plug in 0 0.26 for S and uh, 0 0.03 for zeta, then you'll find that theta is 41.7 degrees, not 45, because we are also accounting for the volume change of transformation. Okay, so this is our deformation matrix and this is our coordinate system. Uh, supposing uh, that we are applying a tensile stress along this vector u, which we will say uh, is sine theta max zero and cos theta max. So this is a, a unit vector because cos squared plus sine squared equals one. And uh, theta max is 41.7 degrees. Uh, then by plugging this equation through this matrix, so if I write a column vector of u here, I get the resultant vector v, which will be this, this, and this as its components. And therefore, I can work out the elongation caused when a sample of austenite transforms completely into the optimum orientation of martensite as 15%. Okay. Now, this is when a fully austenitic sample transforms in this particular orientation of martensite completely you will expect to pick up a 15% elongation just because of the transformation induced shape deformation, okay? So bear that in mind. Now I want to show you the consequence of uh, this uh, transformation induced plasticity. And this is a, a neat experiment where we first deform an austenitic stainless steel at room temperature and then at 200 degrees centigrade in order to reduce the driving force for the transformation from austenite to martensite. And 
if I play the movie, uh, you will see that the stencil specimen is elongating. And that very gentle neck is propagating along the length of the sample without showing a plastic instability for quite a large uh, elongation. Eventually, of course, it must uh, break, but you get a huge amount of uniform elongation because martensite is forming as you pull the sample. Okay. Now, on the other hand, if you make the austenite stable so that it doesn't transform into martensite, then look what happens. So during this deformation now, there is no martensitic transformation because the driving force is insufficient at 200 degrees centigrade for the stress to induce transformation. And very quickly, you get a plastic instability and the sample will break without significant uniform elongation. And uniform elongation is what matters when you're doing formability. So the lesson to take away from here is that austenite is really helping give us uh, considerable uniform elongation when it is able to transform gently as you pull the material. Now the puzzle is uh, that look, uh, sorry, this is not yet uh, a puzzle. Now, if you look at this graph, uh, for the two movies that I showed you. Uh, at, in the room temperature test, you get a much greater elongation than in the sample tested at 200 degrees centigrade, which rapidly undergoes plastic instability. So this one is transforming due, uh, to martensite during the deformation. This one is not, okay? So the trip effect really works in enhancing plasticity. Problem is that strip steels that are fully austenitic are expensive. You know, you can't really use in mass production alloys which contain 30% nickel. They would be prohibitively expensive. So how can we produce cheap austenite? Well, uh, the cheapest element that would stabilize the austenite is carbon. So if we increase the carbon concentration, then we should be able to get the austenite to be stable at ambient temperature, but not stable when you pull it. Uh, now, the problem is there's a limited amount of carbon that we can add because otherwise other properties are compromised. For example, the ability to weld the material and welding is of vital importance in the manufacture, for example, of cars. Well, let's think differently. Uh, supposing we have a low average carbon concentration, but we do something so that the carbon segregates into certain regions where the austenite becomes stable. Okay, now we can do this uh, using the Baynard reaction, where you know the plates form exactly like martensite, but at some stage, they partition carbon. So the carbon concentration of the residual austenite is increased, and we cut off the reaction at this point to prevent cementite precipitation by adding silicon, which greatly retards the precipitation of cementite from austenite. Okay. Now, the way you produce this structure uh, is, is by uh, roughly by isothermal transformation. But just having bainite would make the steels too strong. Okay. So we need to introduce some allotromorphic ferrite first and let the remaining austenite transform into this mixture of bainitic ferrite and carbon enriched retained austenite. Okay. So uh, there are two ways in which you can do that. You start either with a fully austenitic sample, uh, a sheet material and you cool it so that some allotromorphic ferrite forms, so the austenite is already richer in carbon, and then there is a stage where you allow bainite to form, which further enriches the residual austenite, and then cool to ambient temperature. 
And it turns out this temperature regime for the steels that are designed is consistent with, for example, the galvanizing operation. Alternatively, you know, if you start from the hot stage, then you might, you might uh, get some scale on the surface, oxide scale and so forth. So you could start, uh, and also, you know, it's difficult to produce extremely thin uh, sheet when you are hot rolling. So you could start with cold rolled steel and then just heat it into a region where both austenite and ferrite are stable. So you're not going to a high temperature. And then you cool so that the recrystallized ferrite and the carbon enriched austenite will transform into bainite and give you the same sort of result. And the structure looks uh, something like this. You have these large regions of electromorphic ferrite, and then these regions, which are a mixture of bainite plates and retained austenite. Now, we found, uh, so the composition here, the silicon is important because it stops the precipitation of carbides and therefore the carbon is retained inside the austenite. And there's a certain amount of hardenability needed. So there's one and a half weight percent of manganese. Average carbon concentration is low, although the carbon concentration in these regions might get up to one weight percent or more. Okay. So we've achieved our goal of getting an average carbon concentration such that you can still weld this material by many processes. Uh, spot welding is a common, common process used in the automotive industry. But in these regions, the segregated carbon is high enough to make that austenite stable at ambient temperature. So the typical microstructure consists of 70% of allotomorphic ferrite, that much bainitic ferrite, and about 14% of retained austenite. Now, from our earlier calculation, we demonstrated that the maximum strain that we can obtain from the transformation itself, when 100% austenite transforms into the optimum orientation of martensite, is about 15%. But of course, we don't have 100% austenite. We only have 14, 14 or 15% of austenite. So we have to scale this number by the volume fraction of austenite. And that gives us a transformation induced strain of just 2%, which is disappointing. Okay, so there's only 2% of uh, strain caused by the shape deformation itself. So 2.1% elongation due to trip. Nevertheless, when we get the trip effect in this steel, which only has 14% of retained austenite, we get a large amount of transformation plasticity. Now, the other thing to notice between these two curves is that the work hardening here is not really high, whereas this material work hardens quite a lot. And what does work hardening do? Work hardening, wherever you have a stress concentration, if you form martensite in that region, you will harden that region. And therefore, you delay the onset of plastic instability because the plastic instability happens when you focus deformation in a certain region. But if you focus deformation, then you trigger martensite, which is a hard phase. So you work hard in that region and therefore you avoid a plastic instability. So the real reason why this strip steel works, even though it contains a small amount of retained austenite, is that you introduce a work hardening capacity, okay? which gives you a higher strength and gives you a higher ductility. Remarkable, really, the difference between these two. So um, elongation of trip assisted, I'm using trip assisted because we only have 2.1% uh, elongation coming from the transformation itself and only 14% of austenite. And that elongation 
cannot explain the roughly 25% elongation that we actually observe. Right? So that cannot be due to transformation plasticity, but it is because of the work hardening caused at stress concentrations by the hard martensite. And that continues until the amount of austenite that you have in your material is exhausted or refuses to transform under the applied stress. So that is the reason for the tremendous success of the strip assisted steels. Now I want to slightly change the subject. Okay. So this is my bicycle here and you can see it's covered in rust, right? Uh, I've had it for something like 17 years and I've traveled more than 56,000 miles in it to work. Now, the reason why rust doesn't protect, or one of the reasons why rust doesn't protect, is if this is your iron, then the chemical reaction, if you have water on the surface, is that the rust actually forms in the fluid ahead of the steel. It doesn't actually form directly on the steel. And that means it doesn't protect the steel. Okay. Now there is a big advantage in having a rusty bicycle in Cambridge. Uh, it, it, there's no tendency for people to steal it. And you know, this bicycle has been safe with me for something like 17 years because it looks ugly, but it's a really good bicycle actually. I hope there are no thieves listening. Now, you can use rust to advantage if you can make it more compact because then it will form a barrier, okay? It still won't adhere very strongly to the steel, but if it forms a barrier, then it stops the corrosion re reaction. And there is a particular type of steel known as Corten, which contains uh, a certain amount of uh, uh, chromium, roughly, one weight percent of chromium, uh, which, is, which is not high enough to produce a chromium oxide film. And it also contains a small amount of copper. It produces a rust which stays on the steel. And when I visited the Rocky Mountains in, in uh, Colorado, hundreds of miles of fencing and even a building are made using this steel because there is absolutely no maintenance required you know, over a period of more than 40 years. Uh, and the color is really quite nice. It blends in with the natural environment of the National Park. And you can see this uh, again, it looks, looks beautiful actually. So this is quartz and steel and the rust remains on the steel, forming a compact layer, which then acts as a barrier to further corrosion. So there is a, a certain corrosion rate, but it is incredibly small. Now this kind of rust and the rust on my bicycle have beneficial effects, but there is a particular kind of rust, which is not at all conducive to good manufacturing. So we use silicon in trip assisted steels, and silicon forms a low melting temperature. Uh, the silicon in the steel causes the formation of a low melting temperature oxide known as paolite. So when you hot roll the material, uh, you get paolite as a liquid phase, which then penetrates the grain boundaries and really attaches quite strongly to the steel. So the normal processes by which we remove the scale associated with hot rolling don't work perfectly. You retain some of the iron oxide, which then uh, oxidizes further to form the red colored rust. And here is an example. This is uh, really quite terrible because it's hard to get rid of that red oxide. And of course, if you are making, uh, you know, quality components for car, then you do not want this because you wouldn't be able to paint it properly. So our goal was to design a trip assisted steel, which has a low silicon concentration, but we add aluminum, which has the same effect as silicon on retarding the precipitation of cement out. But you know, how do we do this? Um, uh, how do we create such an alloy without doing lots and lots of work? Well, the first thing to do is to collect the huge quantity of data 
on trip steels that exist in the literature. They are not actually trip steels designed for our purpose, but nevertheless, we might be able to capture patterns in the data, highly complex patterns in the data, which help us to go somewhere forward without doing a large number of experiments. In any case, in research, it's a good idea to look at what has been done in the past. So the sort of data we need uh, includes uh, chemical composition, which may have 20 different elements. Uh, it will include uh, mechanical properties that are of interest for the particular application that we are looking at, which is automotive uh, steels. And uh, we need some idea of weldability. And we can set qualitative principles on weldability that look uh, the carbon concentration must not exceed a certain value, otherwise we'll produce a uh, fully myotensitic heat effector zone and then we'll have problems. So the method to handle multivariate and highly complex data is neural networks. And I'm going to very briefly introduce you to neural networks. They have mathematical functions which are very flexible. So here is a mathematical function, which uh, is quite simple. There are two variables, x and y, on the horizontal axis, and we are plotting uh, z along the vertical axis. And in neural networks jargon, uh, this might mean that we have four hidden units. But what it says is that the larger number of hidden units we have, the more complex a function can be. Uh, but just with four of these, hyperbolic tangents, uh, I can actually create a function which really is incredibly flexible. You can see that uh, just by varying the coefficients in that equation, uh, we can produce a surface which sings and dances and, and is extremely flexible. And this applies uh, to however number of variables you have and uh, whatever the nonlinear complexity of the data. So it's a really wonderful method to capture patterns in complicated data. Okay, um, one problem with a highly flexible mathematical function is that you might make it pass through every single data point here. And this red function would have a zero error. This one would not. And this is simply the noise that's associated with the data. So you need a method to decide whether it's this function or this function that in reality captures the behavior of the data. Either could be equally acceptable, okay? Uh, either could be acceptable. Uh, we don't know whether a nonlinear function is justified or a linear function is justified. Now, the way we handle that is if you take your database and you divide it at random into two parts, we use one part for creating the function and the second part for seeing how it generalizes to unseen data. So for example, if I make a prediction in this, uh, in this value of x and it falls here rather than here, then that gives me an indication of the test error. That means the error in making predictions because we are really interested in predictions. We are interested in extrapolating outside of the current knowledge base because otherwise we are not creating anything new. So by looking at the training and the test error, we can decide on the complexity of the function and that's illustrated here. So imagine that the black, dot, the black data are used for training, that means for creating the function, uh, optimizing uh, various features. And then we expose that function to unseen data and see how it behaves. Well, this function here is clearly too simple to capture the complexity of the data. We have another function which is more complex, which passes through every single uh, training data point but behaves badly when we try to extrapolate 
when we try to generalize. Here is a function which represents roughly the training and test data uh, similarly and in a fairly accurate manner. So that is the complexity that we would choose. So if you plot the error, error uh, against the complexity of the model, the training error will go down um, up to a level that you have set because you know no data are precisely accurate unless they are just numbers. Uh, as the complexity increases, you can make the function pass through all the points and therefore this continues to decrease. But the test error will go through a minimum because an overly complex model will also not behave very well in predicting. So you can easily select the complexity of the model and then you have a quantitative method for your design. Now, here are the variables that were being used to create the model. We had the chemical composition, and we do not want predictions which give us a silicon concentration greater than about 0.58%. These are the processing parameters, and uh, we also need to know how much retained austenite will exist in the material because, uh, as I explained to you, the trip effect is important in delaying plastic instability by introducing work harding, hardening by forming untempered martensite. Okay, so after creating the model and looking at, the, at its behavior and making predictions, we came up with this alloy composition and these processing parameters and a prediction that we would have that much uh, retained austenite. Notice quite a large error bar because we are working in a domain where knowledge doesn't exist. And this error bar is, is not associated with noise in experimental data, but the fact that many models which behave similarly where data exist will behave differently in domains where data do not exist. So that's called a modeling uncertainty. And the other surprising thing is this large carbon concentration because a normal trip assisted steel has 0.15 here we have nearly 0.4 weight percent. So you might imagine that this will compromise the weldability of the alloy. Nevertheless, uh, uh, and, and notice also that the aluminum concentration is large to uh, delay the precipitation of cementite from any austenite. Okay, uh, in spite of uh, certain parameters which are worrying, like the carbon concentration. There was no reason not to try this alloy. And one problem with having a large aluminum concentration like this, 2.8%, is that you may actually completely lose the austenite phase field so that from the liquid state, you go directly into ferrite at all temperatures. And indeed that happens when you exceed a certain volume fract, a, a certain percentage of aluminum here, okay. But by calculation using phase diagram thermodynamics, uh, we determined that the alloy actually falls in this narrow region where we have a mixture of gamma and ferrite. Delta is just another name for ferrite which forms at high temperatures, okay? So in an ordinary iron carbon phase diagram, you first get delta ferrite, which is actually exactly identical to alpha, but historically it's called delta. And then you get, it transforms into austenite and then transforms back into alpha ferrite. But with this, we get a, a gamma loop. So if you have a concentration here, you would only have ferrite. You would not have no austenite at all under equilibrium conditions. Now, in our case, uh, our calculations indicated that we would be in a domain where ferrite and austenite can coexist, but never in a domain where you would get 100% austenitic at any temperature. And when we made the material, it has a bizarre microstructure. Uh, these, uh, these are uh, dendrites, these ones are uh, dendrites of delta ferrite. So that's the ferrite which forms from the liquid. Uh, 
and then the remaining liquid transforms, uh, solidifies into austenite. And this is the region where we introduce bainite by heat treatment. Now, this microstructure looks completely different from the other microstructure on trip assisted steel that I showed you, where we had something like 60 or 70 percent of electromorphic ferrite and some regions of uh, retained austenite and bainite. Here, the delta ferrite is stable from the liquid temperature, uh, from the solidus temperature, and remains in this dendritic form right down to room temperature. It doesn't change uh, because of the large aluminum concentration and the nature of the iron aluminum phase diagram. But we have sufficient austenite uh, so that we can do a heat treatment which gives us the bainitic microstructure here. Okay. So, okay, we had problems with the carbon concentration and uh, we have a bizarre microstructure. But actually, the carbon concentration problem is solved because in this alloy, the delta ferrite is stable to the melting temperature, it will not disappear. So if you do a spot weld with a very rapid cooling rate, you will not never be able to produce a 100% martensite in the heat affected zone. So in spite of its high carbon concentration, this is a weldable steel. Let's have a look at its mechanical properties. Uh, and uh, you know, the first thing you do is a simple tensile test. And here it is. And here we are plotting the engineering stress and the screw stress. And you know, it's a very, very nice elongation very gentle work hardening, uh, but this is more or less uniform elongation. And we have the right level of strength, uh, something of the order of a thousand megapascals, in other words, one gigapascal. And we can see that the retained austenite is doing its job. We start off with that much austenite after, after transforming um, into bainite, you're left with carbon enriched retained austenite, which decomposes steadily under the influence of um, tensile testing. And we are finally left with about 7% of austenite. Now, supposing we repeat this test, but at 100 degrees centigrade, which makes the austenite more stable. In other words, it um, decreases its um, uh, driving force for transformation. Then we get a dramatic reduction in the ductility and you can see that the austenite is not actually decomposing. So once again, we prove that the role of the austenite is to prevent plastic in, early onset of plastic instability. Okay, now I'm going to show you how these, uh, this steel performs with respect to existing alloys, okay? And this is conventionally done in a plot of elongation versus ultimate tensile strength. And the red dots here uh, our so-called delta trip steel. Okay, so we call it the delta trip steel. And, you know, we've got a high strength and we've got a high total elongation. So uh, this looks different, actually, the amount of elongation looks different from the graph that I just showed you, because there was a further development of the alloys after the initial laboratory experiments. So we've achieved really quite a large elongation. Uh, and uh, these are commercially available steels for a variety of automotive purposes, and we do better than them. Now notice that there are some points here which look extraordinarily good. I'll come back to those in the next lecture. There are a special class of steels called twinning induced plasticity steels, uh, but they are much more expensive because they have large concentrations of manganese, something like 28 percent. Okay, so now, uh, you know, we follow our procedures. We've established uh, the properties in, you know, 100 gram melts made in Cambridge. Uh, we've established the properties with uh, 100 kilograms of material, and then you scale it up to a much larger concentration. And here you are, this is the actual delta trip steel, which is continuously cast, hot rolled, and then 
cold rolled, nice, nice and shiny. And then it goes through what's known as a continuous annealing line to implement the heat treatment. And these are the finished coils of the Delta trip steel. So again, this is an example of alloy design. The neural network method is extremely powerful for complex pro problems. Combined with other models, for example, the phase diagram calculation models and other models which I haven't mentioned, you can actually reach a goal much faster than you would do if you simply made a, a series of alloys. That's all for today. Thank you.